of st statisticians, quants as we, as we would call them. And over the years, we've had to develop models from idea conception to production level fitters so that they could be rerun and, and uh, re refit every day. And then we have the production code that actually runs those models and tries to make money in the real world. Uh, so I've come up with, or I, I have a model for how we can do this in a sensible way such that, such that everyone gets what they want from the development end to the statisticians end and we kind of meet in the middle and get something that we can reuse for many different things um, throughout time. This is really the goal of software design. So today I'm going to speak on dependable developments of statistical models and jokingly called how I wrote code once and used it again, which you'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen in the real world. We write it and it lives on in infamy just as it is. Uh, so um, what we're going to cover is a useful workflow, as I mentioned, for getting the idea from, to, from conception to production. We're going to talk about how to write code in such a way that we can use it in the future. Now, there's several facets of this we're going to touch on is coding style, um, creating sensible functions, and writing code that can be easily verified as correct. This is, this, this is a really key point in industry because I have to know that what my production system is doing is the same thing that the researcher expects. So we have, we, we have, we have to agree here. Um, and then ongoing code maintenance and concerns are mostly related to that last point I made, that we have the same thing going on. We're not going to discuss, we're not going to discuss the specifics of R and C++ syntax. That's not, that's not an interesting concept and you can learn more on the web probably than, than you could from me uh, right, right here. And the model formulation, I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and present a toy model. It's simply an illustration. It's not really meant to be a you know, proper statistical model, but I, I will present that. Um, and actually making money, no, it's a toy. We're not, we're not going to actually make money with it, so I'm sorry you're not going to be rich when you leave. <laughs> There's a couple terms I'm going to be using throughout the throughout here that are second nature to me, but I wanted to get them out there uh, for you guys who may not have as much knowledge of the jargon we use in the financial industry. An exchange traded yeah, exchange traded fund, an ETF. That's a marketable security that tracks the value of a basket of assets. A good example here is SPY, which tracks the S&P 500 index. Um, the company that runs it essentially holds the basket of 500 stocks and sells the ETF as, that will track the value of that basket of, uh, of, of assets. A sector, for our purpose today, is going to be one of the subdivisions of that particular index. We are going to speak about that index. There are uh, 11 sectors, I think, in the uh, S&P 500. Um, these are, um, there's manufacturing, there's financials, and things like that. The, the actual definitions of them aren't important, and you can look that up on the web if we're interested, but it's not, not a real concern, but the S&P 500 is made up of sectors. Um, a price, our purpose is today, we're going to use the final price that an asset traded at within a one minute period, we'll call this the close price. Not to be confused with the closing price, which is the end of day close, but we're going to take samples every, every minute, we're going to say the last sample we get in that minute, that's the price we're going to take, that'll be, that'll be our price today. Forward price is going to be a price at some time in the future. And a return, this is not a technical definition, but we're just going to say a measure of the current price of an asset against some historical representation of the price of the same asset. Um, and we'll get, we'll, get, we'll get more into that later. I'm going to use the term return loosely here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a model that's going to predict the value of the S&P 500 index in, at some time in the future. This is the goal of Things like this are the goal of most of us in the financial industry, and if we can predict where the price is going to be, and we're right, we can buy or sell it accordingly and profit from it. Um, we're going to create our code to fit this model. We're going to start by proving the concept that we have a model that can be fit, that can be written. We're going to move on to production code for fitting that we can actually reuse for future models and things like that. We're going to get it into a form that it's beneficial to us in our work going forward, and not just for what we did today. Um, we're going to create C++ code to enact this model in production, and we're going to validate that these things match, that we're actually doing the same thing in research as we are in production. And I, 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 I'm lying here, but we'll profit afterwards. So coding style, we mentioned before. 
this, this is how the code actually works. And it's, very, it's a very uninteresting concept that people will spend infinities of time talking about because everyone has their own opinion on it, and in the end, it's really just an opinion. It's very important, and consistency is the main point that you want to have. You want your code to always look the same. The reason is, because your eyes get adjusted to reading it like that, you'll be able to easily reconcile code that you wrote six months ago uh, and read it quickly and understand what it's trying to do. So the real, the, the, the real general rule here is just find something you're comfortable with or is mandated. At my firm, we have mandated coding style and we just do it um, and get used to it because your eyes will get used to just about anything, but it it's just makes it easier to read everything. So an example of bad coding style here. What you'll see here is we created some function. Parameter one is a camel case thing where you're using underscores and numbers in the second one. The third one is hard to read. We really want consistency. As noted before, we want consistency in this. Um, you'll notice also in this example, different brace placement in different places. I've named this function differently than that function up there. You should be able to recall names of functions without having to go look. So if you name them consistently, it's pretty easy to say, yeah, I had a function called calculate EMA, and it's lowercase c to start with and capital EMA, or whatever, whatever style you come up with, you should be able to recall it easily. And that's the, that's the key here. So this is bad. This is, this is just all around bad. Um, and it will work just fine, which is why I say this is, there's, there's, there, there's some, uh, <laughs> there, it really comes down to personal preference or company mandates at this point. Now this one we've done a little better here. We've got both of our functions, you'll note, are named in our camel case. What, what, that, what that means for those of you that don't know is start with a lowercase, then each word gets a capital. Um, we call it camel casing pumps on a camel, so there's humps throughout, throughout, throughout the word. Um, here we've got consistent brace placement, consistent parameter names, and uh, everything just looks nicer. You're going to be able to return to this and say, yes, that works. Now, going to opinion, this is also fine. We use underscores and under underscores in our function names and parameter names. We did a little bit different brace placement, but again, it's consistent throughout. And that's really what we're going for here. By the way, the content of these functions is totally unimportant. They are strictly examples. They, they don't do anything. In fact, I don't even remember what they do. So they, they're, they're strictly there for an illustration of coding style. A couple things I've found useful. Don't go over 80 characters in a line. It's an archaic restriction from 80 by 25 terminals. But also, when you print things, Notepad and most text editors, <coughs> characters is what they end up getting on a page. And you'd actually be surprised how often I end up printing out code just so I can look, have a hard copy there to look at while I'm doing six other things. Um, vertical white space is nice. You can separate logically grouped blocks of code. And I'll, I'll, I'll give an illustration of this later. But vertical white space is your friend. You know, we have big screens today. We can even turn them on their on, on our on end and extend extend our vertical um, vertical space and and what we what we get there is grouping logical grouping that is easy for the eye to see. Um, just name functions that I mentioned before consistently and sensibly. They should be named what they do. So as I said, we're going you know, to talk about a financial model today. Now, stock market data is what we build on. We build on prices, and I said we're going to use one-minute bars and use the close price from that one-minute bar. Um, this is just a plot of the close prices. This is XLF, which is the financial sector uh, tracking ETF, and this is SPY, which is the S&P 500. So this one is a component of this. Um, so theoretically, if you summed up all the sector ETFs, you should get the S&P index. Um, what we're going to try to do is use the price movements in this to predict that in the future, sometime in the future. Uh, for our purposes today, we're just using CSV files that have the have our data in it. So it's got a column header. I mean, time, open, high, low, close, number of events, volume, value. We don't care about those. We're really just going to be using time and close today. But I wanted to give you an example of data is often presented in this format. And it, it's actually an inconvenient format when you're dealing with a lot of data, but we're dealing with minute data, so it's not so much data. So it's fine for that 
There's lots of other format, formats, HDF5. We can use just strictly binary formats where we simply dump binary out to the file, but this one's easy to understand and read. Also, R provides us read.csv, which will simply bring this data in. So that's, that, that, that's a nice uh, starting point. So what we're going to generate here is a simple linear model to predict the forward price of, of SQI using returns on the sector ETFs. We're going to use, as we mentioned, the open, high, low, close bars at one minute intervals. We're going to use the close price minus an exponential moving average of the close price of that same asset as our factors. Um, when we're going to try to predict the difference between the close at time 10, set, uh, 10 minutes in the future and time, and time now in the S&P 500. The model outline, so here we have SPY, which is what we're trying to predict, and those are all, those are all the sector um, ETFs that we're going to use to try to predict it. And as it turns out, we're actually going to use SPY as well, because SPY has some predictive value on where it's going to, the current price, or the current trend of SPY is going to have some predictive value on the future price of SPY. We're going to use the dates between the 3rd of January and the 20th of January in 2017, and then we're going to fill some data frame with data. Um, I, I, we'll, we'll go over that briefly in, in a few minutes here, but for now it's enough to understand that we're going to fill all data with some data. We're going to then calculate, we're going to then create a formula, and what we're going to try to predict is the forward SPY minus the close of SPY, which is, which is our um, future price minus our current price. And we're going to try to predict that with, this ends up being the difference of the close of each symbol and the email of each symbol. Uh, symbol. We'll, call that, we'll call that a return for our purposes. I realize it isn't, but um, that's fine. We're going to create the formula. We're also going to kill the intercept. This, this minus one at the end, we're just going to get rid of the intercept. We're not going to worry about that. And simply use R's LM function to fit it. And we're going to get... Could I yes. just ask oh, you a question? Absolutely. Could you remind the students of like, what is a EMA? Oh, EMA, I'm sorry. Exponential moving average. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you want a formula for it? Oh, no, no, no. no just okay. explain generally what it means. Oh, uh, so an exponential moving average simply takes in the historical price series and waits. It lags the price, essentially. It keeps a historical record of the price. And we're taking the current price minus the historical record of that price as our factor. Which brings actually up an interesting point, which may or may not be important, but my first firm called it EMA. And then a new guy took over the quant department there, and it became EMA. And then I joined Sun, and now it's EMA again. So it's all very confusing, but EMA is easier to say. So I prefer that. So we're going to take a first pass at it. When we're developing this model, we need to start somewhere. We need to get something working. We're going to figure out how to get our data. We're going to calculate the factors we want. We're going to fit the model. And then we're going to determine, determine if it has any validity and if we want to pursue an actual production implementation. Most things in my industry die right here. We, we, have, we have ideas. We try, we try it out. And it simply doesn't work or simply doesn't give us enough pred prediction to be worthwhile. So lots of things die right here. But if we can get past this point, then it may be worth productionizing our code, making it useful for the future. So we're going to go quickly through this. Um, all the code is available on GitHub. You'll be, you'll be able to look at it more in depth if you wish to later. But essentially, we're going to loop over all the dates. We're going to loop over all our symbols. We're going to read in and this just happens to be the location of the data in when, when, I, when I was writing this code. But we're going to read in the data, um, which is organized in, in a directory structure. We're going to use read CSV to pull it into a variable called A, because I'm being sloppy and just trying to get something done. Um, alpha, that's, our decay, that's going to be our decay on the exponential moving average. Um, so it's 1 minus alpha times the previous, plus alpha times the uh, current observation. We're going to sample the data. Now, we, we have minute bars to start with, but one thing to be with data is sometimes data is just missing. So what this is essentially going to do is resample all the data at one minute <laughs> intervals and carry forward any missing, uh, carry forward the previous value to any missing observations within our data set. 
we're going to calculate the emails right here. So as you, as you see, we're going to bootstrap it as the first value. And then we're simply going to use the exponential moving average calculation um, if, if it's not, if we don't need to bootstrap, if we have a previous value. And we're going to add that column to our data, data set. We're going to calculate the forward prices. So we're going to, we said we were going to look forward 10. So we're going to look, look forward 10 and bring that onto the same row as our time data at time t. And then we're going to have the forward data there as well. This is creating the data frame that we can actually uh, use LM on. And we're going to add the data columns for the symbol. And then finally, append this day's data to all data. And we have our all data structure from which we can predict. And as you see, we get a model. Um, it's not a very good model, but, it, but, 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 but it's a model. So we have coefficients here. Now, here I'm going to say this model has validity. 2% R squared at 10 minutes is outrageously good, actually, for, uh, for, uh, for this kind of model. It means, but it's too good. <clears throat> so <laughs> there's something wrong. So in real practice, we would go back here and say, I've done something wrong because I'm just getting way too good a 10 minute prediction. Um, for our purposes, we have to plot forward because we need to make production code and that's what this is all about. So what we did here, it's kind of scratch work. Um, we didn't optimize or design it, we just got it to work. And that's fine. That is fine when we're first conceiving of a model. That is fine and necessary. Um, when we go forward, well, what we got out of this was sloppy code. It's, we're not going to be able to modify it. I don't know what the variable A means anymore. If I look at that in six weeks, I may, may or may not even understand what it's doing. But we did get a proof of concept. We got some model. So we're going to take a second pass at it. We're going to try to make some sensible functions to encapsulate some of the things we did there. In fact, they're going to align very much with the comments that were in that code. We're going to name our variables reasonably, and we're going to generate a shorter main code, which is where I set up the model and actually fit the model, what I have, what I have to write outside of the functions. So here's a proposal. We will create a get symbol data, which is going to get the raw data and add emails for a single symbol. Seems sensible because we need that. Um, get day data, we'll take a list of symbols and, um, and, and essentially C bind them together. If you know the C bind R function, we're going to stack them so that every row has the current observation of every symbol there and the EMA of every symbol. Get all data is going to create our all data structure. It's going to call get day data, which we'll in turn call get symbol data to create the entire data set we need to fit our model. And then we're going to create fit model, which whose job will be to create the formula and call LM and return us the results. That seems pretty reasonable because now we've got we've encapsulated all the complexity. We have, we only have four functions here, and then we get code that looks like this. This is all we have to write to fit our model. So we set our symbols, set our dates. Say we 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 actually pass it the symbol we want to predict, and the symbols we want to use as drivers, and the dates. That's it, and we get a result. And I don't have it here, but it is the same result I assure you um, as, as the first one. So we've done the right thing. Now what do we do? Well, we created functions, we created some reasonable functions. Um, our main code is very, very simple. And from that, we can use any symbol set to fit any symbol, right? Because we can simply, pa simply pass, pass in different drivers and different, uh, a different responder. Did we create a reusable design? Well, maybe. And this is kind of the crux of the whole thing. I've been here, I've had this code that does this. What it does is it fits one model. It is a lot cleaner, it has reasonable functions, and we can reuse it for identical models on different symbol sets. But it hides the whole thing from us, it hides our data from us. Because the first question you're going to ask, well, what if I did this with the same data? I have the same data set, what if I used a different type of fit? What if I, what, what if I used a quadratic fit? What if I used any, any, num any number of things? And we don't have that, it hides all, all it returns to us. We call one function, we get that fit. We do get really, really simple main code, which is attractive. Now it's 
it's okay. It's it's not bad. But I've been stuck here. There's been we, we spent many iterations where we did the scratch work. We said this is a good production system. And then as soon as somebody wants to do something else a little bit different with it, it's impossible. So we move on. What do we really want? Well, we want our model data. We'd like access to it. I think um, we'd like to uh, generalize framework for building data sets and for adding features. And this will actually generate a way to fit different models. So how do we keep this? Well, the first thing is data and raw data and features are kind of fundamentally different concepts and marrying them as we did in the first example or the second example isn't quite the right thing to do. You really want to keep that separate. And the reason is because then you can generate many different kinds of features. If you have the raw data, you can just write feature generators and every feature you dream up. I mean, if it's, I, you know what, I can't think of a good example. So, but any feature you can dream up. Uh, and then we can create, create a suite of, so we can create a suite of feature generators and create formula, formulas uh, from those data sets and fit them however we want. I mean, if we wanted to do price on price regression, we could. It would not be advised because prices aren't stationary, but, but one could. So we're going to take one more pass at it to try to get, get it really where we want it to be. And we're going to separate these concerns, feature generation and data, data acquisition. We're going to generalize our functions a little bit more. We're going to really think about the big picture, and this goes, goes to producing new models in the future so that we can reuse this code for real. So we're going to create this get raw symbol data. Now, if you remember the, the, the first function we had before, got the raw symbol data and then calculated the emails for you right away. This just gets the data. So it's a little more basic function. It gives us what we buy here is flexibility. We're just getting the data. Um, we created a sample function. Sample, uh, this is for sampling in a minute. Like I said, if there's missing data, it'll carry forward. That's encapsulated that in the code function. And now we get to the feature generators. We're going to have a calculated email function. What this will do, we'll give it our data set as it stands. Probably well, we return from get raw data. We'll tell it which column we want an EMA of and what, the alpha, what alpha we want to use. And it will simply append a column to our data frame called whatever column was called dot email. We get, we, we get that out of there. Calculate forward is a lot like a, it's not really a feature, it, but it uh, kind of goes along with those mm, derived data type of, or derived data that you'd like to add to your data set. Um, then we create these functions, my model get data, so we can kind of encapsulate some of our, our model for this particular model. It will call the functions previously to get all the data that we need. This we pass in the symbols we want, the dates. Because, we want, because my model, I know I want EMA, so we're going to pass an alpha in it. We're going to tell it the lag, which is essentially how, maybe poorly named, but um, how far in the future we're going to look, how many observations in the future we're going to look. And we'll give it the directory under which our data lives. It's a little more general than we had before. It, it, it lets us move things around and do slightly different things. And then my model fit, which again, we'll calculate the formula we need. And, <coughs> excuse me and generate the actual fit. So then we get this as our main code here. The first part looks the same, essentially. Now we get the data as a single step with my model get data, which calls those lower level functions that we have. We calculate our result with the my model fit. And oh look, we can calculate result two, my model fit for a different symbol if we wanted to use the same drivers. This will calculate a model for predicting SPY based on the drivers that we have. This one will create the same model uh, for XLF. So we can, we've now extended it, made it useful in this sense to do different models on, um, of the same type on the same data set. But, and how we did that is we preserved our data so we don't have to go back and get it again. So, from, from here, we have, we have what I think is pretty decent code. We can get data, we can operate on data, and then we can fit data. The general purpose functions, the data, data acquisition functions and feature functions, can really be moved into their own R package. And we can reuse that for anything we're doing in the future. 
whatever, whatever we want. We can take the model specific functions, the ones that where, where I prefix them with my model, into their own package as well, and then we have a package for generating that particular model. Um, the production scripts, as we showed before, sorry, I'm going to go back to it, are still simple. I mean, it's you know, 15 lines of code, um, and now we have a way to get data and get features so we can generate different models. And of course, you can put them in their own packages too when you generate a new model, which is my model two fit or whatever you like. So we're done. We've got a model. It fits. It, it works. It's got reasonable predictive <laughs> qualities. Well, no. Um, at least in my industry, research is really only half the battle. Research, you get a model. You get a prediction of a future price of an asset. You get to act on it. You have to buy low and sell high to make money. We do this with, with production code, which is separate from the research process, typically. And the main reason for this is it's different specializations. What you, what you have is you guys who specialize in statistics, and then you have developers like me, we specialize in making code work for, for real-time systems. And I think this will carry over to other, other industries as well, but it's the separation is fairly stark in my industry because we really need people who are very specialized at both things. So when we interface with the production team, we're going to be sure the production implementation is identical to our research as we touched on earlier, and we want to be able to make changes in either and have them reflected and be sure of them in production, and we like to be nice to guys like me, because we're really, try we're, we're really trying to help. Um, there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of study and everything you're doing that goes into creating these models, and it's very complex, and guys like me, we don't know that much, we, we don't know that much about it, but we want to help. We, we really do. I've been fortunate to be work with wonderful quants in my time who have imparted on me enough knowledge that I can stand up here and <laughs> stand up here and talk to you somewhat sensibly about statistics. But um, so, but you know, that's that you want to have a relationship at that when you when you cross that line because I'm a specialist in one thing, you're a specialist in one thing. But if we can't work together well, it's the end product is not going to come out well. So when we, build, when we build the production code, we want to build, we're going to have to build a predictor. We don't have to build a fitter because you're going to fit it on, with the code that we just went over, and you're going to produce that fit and give it to me. I need to just do predictions based on that fit. Um, but make the, they need to be made as simple as possible. I can't stress this enough. The model is only math. Make sure the implementation reflects that. I have seen it way too many times in, in my past where the calculator in the production system is not a simple do the, do the math. It's tightly integrated with configuration parameters of the, of, of the production system and tightly integrated with, in fact, entire libraries of code in the production system. So to, to use that calculator, you have to pull all that other stuff in. If it's just math, just do the math there. Um, and that goes to the second point. We want to make sure it can be configured without external dependencies. Again, it's just math and build unit tests. Because you, uh, if you're not familiar with the concept of unit tests, it would be a simple thing to say that I've calculated this model fit. I have these um, 12 coefficients. And I need to multiply them by 12 values. Does my predictor correctly multiply and sum them up? Does my predictor, predictor correctly do that multiplication and sum? It's a simple unit test. You simply wrap around your predictor, set some known values, expect a known result. That better always work. And that gives you your first step. So if we followed, and I know I emphasize this greatly, that it's just math and we make it have not exter no external dependencies, we can easily use a tool like RCPP to build our interface to the one we're going to, to the implementation of the predictor that we're going to use in production. And then we can build a comparison between the production predictor and our research predictor in R, so that we can both say, meet in the middle here, we run, we run your fit, your prediction, my prediction, and they match. And we can say that, yes, we have the same thing, and then we're not fighting with each other trying to figure out who's wrong or what's wrong. I mean, because that's, that's an endless drain on time and resources to do that. I've been there, I've done that, and it's just, it's just hard. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bore you. I know I know C++ is. Can I ask you a question? Yes. We get into this. yes. Can you explain why typically you would start with a code in R or maybe mathematics or something like this, and then sure. you would decide to use something like C++ in the second phase of the development? Absolutely. So in my in my industry, it's a very obvious thing. Um, R is a great language for prototyping things for doing statistics. R is a, R is a horrible language for a real time uh, for a real time system that has to be fast enough to keep up with the market. It's simply not fast enough. It is very full featured and very easy to get going with when you're doing statistics. It's just not suited to the task. So you use the language that's suited to the task that that, that you're uh, trying to do. In production, we're trying to send actual orders into the financial markets. In research, you're just trying to do research. That's that that can be a little slower and e and easier to use. It's a much e R is a much easier language to use than C++. It, it simply is. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to build a predictor, and I'm not going to get too deep into this because I know this is kind of out of <coughs> the scope of, of, of what you guys are going to do. But I want you to be aware of it. Um, we're going to pass in, pass in our coefficients, which I've called betas, and I should have just called coefficients here. I'm, I apologize. We've referred to them as betas for a thousand years in, in our industry, so um, I just kind of went on autopilot there. Uh, pass in, pass in our, our coefficients, the number of coefficients, and the decay for our EMA there. Um, we're going to update prices with an array of prices, and then predict um, the prediction, and we have to give it the current price of the asset we're trying to predict. Oh, sorry, I want to go back there one more time. So, so in practice, we're going, to, uh, we're going to use this predictor, we're going to set it up with, with our coefficients, and then we're going to call update prices every minute with the closed prices of all the assets. And every minute we, following that, we will call predict, and we get our prediction for the 10-minute uh, forward price of, 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 our, of the asset we're trying to predict. This is this to me right here is the beauty of it, and this is when we when we work together effectively with the statisticians and the production team, we can do things like this. Now I don't know how many of you are familiar with our CPP. Um, it lets you link C plus plus code into R, as was earlier mentioned, and it's really quite easy. So we create this function called prod predict. What it takes in is our time series of prices that we've created already, basically our raw data that we've created. And what it kicks out is a prediction just like using our prediction function, you know, a, vector, a, a vector of the predictions. So we set our betas. I've hard coded it here for clarity. You probably wouldn't want to do that in, in the real world. You'd probably want to make it configurable in some way where you could pass those in. But for clarity here, we're just going to hard code our betas using what we failed earlier. Um, we're going to set up our predictor. Passing in the betas, the number of betas, and the alpha that we want to decay the uh, exponential moving average on. And then for every row in the passed in prices vector or matrix, we're going to grab all the prices, put them in an array, pass them into update prices, and then to our return vector, add the uh, prediction from our production predictor here, and return it. What we get then is something like this. And these are the libraries I created. I, I took the liberty of actually creating the libraries that I specified earlier. So you can all, see that all on GitHub if you're interested. And I'm happy to show more and talk, talk about it more later if you like. But uh, so we load the two libraries. The data library is the get data functions that we created in the third pass through it. Um, the tester is simply the RCPP code that we just looked at here. So we, call, we, we declare those functions as we did before, or maybe we put them in a package. Get our symbols, alpha, look forward, get our data, fit our model. We have our result here. So we're going to use R's predict function to predict, with our fit, the data from the uh, 3rd of January. And 
Our prediction is the difference. If you if you recall, we can, we can go back to that. But if you recall, we're predicting the difference between the forward price and the and the current price. So we have to add in the current price there, which is close close of spy as we said. Our C prediction, we simply call it step three to five tester, prod predict, and we pass in the uh, first 11 columns of our data frame, which happen to be the closed prices. Um, that's how it's organized. And then we run this to see if they're the same, and in fact they are. Now we have code that everyone can be pleased with from the research end to the production end. To make a change on the research end, I need to reflect it on the production end, and we have this where we can go back and say, yes, it works, or no, it doesn't. So fundamentally, the first pass when we go and write crappy code that just gets the work done is going to always be a necessity. We're always going to have to take that because we're just brainstorming, trying to come up with some way of modeling something. Um, if you think about separating our concerns, data acquisition, feature generation, and so on and so forth correctly, we can skip that second step where we got something that we thought looked pretty good, but it really wasn't flexible enough for reuse, and we would have ended up scrapping it at some time. Now, my, my when, I, when I was at Catch and Trading, we did the scratch work, got it there, and just iteration after iteration after iteration of not quite getting it right until we finally got it right. Once it got right, everything became much easier. But if we can think about it in the right way, we can skip all those iterations. I mean, we wasted time and money and sanity on it. Um, research is, in, at least in my industry, and I, I, I feel like it's probably extendable to other industries, not, it's just half the battle. You have to realize the research to actually make money or provide a service or whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do. And since I've always wanted to say this because it used to drive me nuts when professors said it, making money on a model like this is really left as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> All of the code and sample data is available there. Um, we can go over it. The slides are also available there as a PDF. If you prefer a different format, you can talk to me after the class. I'm happy to put it up there in whatever format you want. Um, <coughs> all of the example code for the C++ is there. The RCPP package. The two packages we noted there are all, all created. Um, and you can run it all. I'm Dan Dillon. That's my LinkedIn, my GitHub if you're interested. I work for Sun Trading. And if you're interested in any of that stuff, feel free to talk to me or contact me via LinkedIn or whatever in the future. Thank you very much.